On March 6, 2015, Rudolph Rudy Farias IV decided to take his two beloved dogs on a walk around his neighborhood in Houston, Texas. It was a nice near summer's night, and Rudy wanted to get outside and give his dogs a nice walk before the family turned in for the night. The 17-year-old left at around 6.30 p.m., wearing a pair of blue jeans, a black t-shirt, gray cotton gloves, and brown shoes. He told his mother that he planned to take the dogs around the block and would be back at home in 20 minutes, and with that, he left. Rudy's mother, Janie Santana, continued to go about her nightly routine until around 7.30 p.m. when she heard one of the family's dogs outside. One of their dogs had returned home, dragging their leash behind them, but notably, Rudy and their other dog were nowhere in sight. This was obviously strange, as Rudy was also extremely careful. He would have never let go of their leash during a walk, and the fact that the dog had found its way back to the house without him was incredibly strange. Realizing that it had been nearly an hour since Rudy left, Janie quickly ushered the dog inside before deciding to go find her son. After walking around the route that Rudy had told her he was going to be on and finding no sign of her son, she began to panic. Rudy was 17 years old, but he was developmentally impaired and, according to family, had the mind of a 10-year-old. Rudy had grown up facing a significant amount of hardships in his life. At 13 years old, his best friend and older half-brother, Charles Uresti, was killed in a motorcycle crash. When the family heard about the crash, they quickly rushed to Charles' side to be with him during his final moments. However, this moment would deeply traumatize the 13-year-old, and afterward, he would be diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and PTSD. In 2014, his father, Rudolf Farias, would take his own life by shooting himself in the head in a police parking garage. His father had worked for 21 years as a police officer, and in his final weeks of life, was exposed for taking part in a ticket-rigging scam. According to KHOU11, who initially reported on this scam, Rudy's father and three other officers would list one another as witnesses on speeding tickets, so they could later testify in court and get paid overtime. But the problem was that records showed they were also writing tickets at the same exact time, at a completely different location. The investigation showed that this scheme had netted Farius over $100,000 in overtime, and in response, he was stripped of his badge and his job, and subsequently, he took his own life. Following the death of his half-brother and father, Rudy became incredibly withdrawn and depressed, and the only person he spent time with was his mother. She did what she could to coax him out of his shell, to try and bring him back into the world, but nothing seemed to work. Janie tried not to panic, and after talking with some friends and family, she went back home and went to sleep. She hoped that she would wake up to Rudy at her front door or a call, saying that he spent the night at a friend's house. But the next morning, when their other dog returned home without Rudy, she called the police. Janie was frantic, telling the police that her son was developmentally and physically impaired, walking with a limp due to having cancer on his right leg earlier in life. She also noted that Rudy could be considered at risk, given that it had been days since he took his medication and he didn't have his inhaler. In the following days, Texas EquiSearch would conduct multiple searches for Rudy, only suspending the search after weather conditions were deemed unsafe for the search to continue. Volunteers came out in the rain, looking for the young adult, and were told that if they found him, he might be wary of their help. As time went on, the search for Rudy would wane, with other cases taking precedent over his own. On March 22, 2015, Janie would create a GoFundMe, asking for donations to help her privately fund a search for her only living son, and the community at large would donate upwards of $2,000. A year would go by with no sign of Rudy. Police would regularly speak with Janie, who would do her best to provide them with any new information that she could. She told them that a girl in the neighborhood had come to her and confessed that the day that Rudy went missing, she had seen him struggle with a group of men around his age. She claimed that the group was harassing Rudy, and Rudy seemed upset. In turn, they brought her what they believed to be Rudy's backpack which they'd found near what they believed to be the abduction site, and after finding the inhaler inside, Janie confirmed it was her son's. Reportedly, they also told her that they suspected that Rudy had been abducted as part of a drug trafficking ring, and when she got the opportunity to speak on her child's disappearance on National Missing Children's Day, she was forced to hide her own identity for her protection. I'm afraid. She'll share her fears, but not her face. He hasn't checked his Facebook. He hasn't checked emails just nothing it's been that way for more than a year no word no signs of rudolph rudy farias a 17 year old pasadena high school student and his mom's only living son it happened too fast he um 
disappeared. Rudy was last seen walking his dogs right down here along Park Avenue that evening. He should have returned home in about 15 minutes, but his mom never saw him again. He has such a huge heart. <laughs> he loves with all his heart, so that's why we know that he wouldn't just get up and go on his own. It, that's not him. Detectives have warned family members that he may have been abducted and sold for human drug trafficking. That's why she's hiding her face. It's, it's a nightmare that you want to wake up from. But like so many other parents of missing kids, without answers, the nightmare continues. That's what's killing me inside. Rux Russell. The following year, Rudy's missing person flyer would be placed on multiple billboards with the hopes that it would generate some leads for the case, but nothing would come of it. Eight years passed without any word from Rudy or updates in the investigation. Then, on June 29th, 2023, an anonymous Good Samaritan spotted a man laying on the ground outside of a church at the intersection of 76th and Avenue K in southeast Houston and called 911. When the cops arrived, they found a man laying on the steps of the church with cuts and bruises all over his body. He was incoherent, but the police were able to immediately identify him as Rudy Farias because he was wearing a necklace that belonged to his late brother. He also had a credit card belonging to his mother on his person. Shockingly, Rudy was found just 25 minutes away from where he had last been spotted nearly eight years ago, and he was in a bad state. Rudy was immediately taken to the hospital, and it was initially reported that he wasn't doing well. His mother released a statement on Facebook, writing, We want to thank the media and the public for all their support. My son, Rudy Farias IV, was found on Thursday, June 29th, after being missing for eight years. Currently, we do not have any information on Rudy's case. What we do know is at the time of his recovery, a good Samaritan located him unresponsive and immediately called the police and 911. My son Rudy is receiving the care that he needs to overcome his trauma, but at this time, he is nonverbal and not able to communicate with us. We are asking for privacy during this difficult time, but we will share more details as Rudy continues to heal. People celebrated Rudy's return. It's extremely rare for a missing person, especially a young adult, to be found, and the world had questions. Where had he been all this time? What exactly had he gone through? How did he end up beaten at the church? But mostly, people were just excited that he was home, safe and sound. Or at least, they would have been, had they not found out that Rudy's disappearance and the entire case was a lie. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. Or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we're going to be covering the case of Rudy Farias, the boy who was never missing. This case was one of the most highly requested cases we've ever done. As from the moment it broke, people have been sending me emails demanding we cover it as soon as possible. With that in mind, all the information I will be providing is subject to change, and I'll likely have to make a follow-up video in the coming months. Everything that I say in this video has been fact-checked by a third party, and all of said information was published by various other sources. If you think we are missing any key information in this case, it was likely purposely left out, as it could not be verified. That isn't to say it's untrue, but just that as of the time of writing, it has not been confirmed. So with all of that said, let us begin. Before we get into what happened to Rudy, we have to discuss his mother, Janie Santana. This is Janie. However, she would rarely, if ever, use her own picture on social media, instead choosing to use images of a much younger, more conventionally attractive woman. She created a Facebook account for herself using these images and populated her friends list with fake accounts that she ran herself, filling up her page with messages of love and support on every post. On some of these accounts, she would portray a country singer who was trying to get her break in the industry. On others, she was a wife and mother, but each of these accounts were interconnected in some way, and they would routinely interact with each other, creating a web of fictional relationships. On TikTok, she posted under the name Alexis Santana, and once more, portrayed a blonde hair, blue-eyed young adult who found out her husband was cheating on her, and had a crush on Lance Bass growing up, and would post things like this. I want to find a guy who lets me treat him like the king he is, bring him an ice-cold drink after mowing the lawn, make him a home-cooked meal, bake him desserts from scratch. Do old-fashioned guys still exist? She also posted this, using a filter to put this blonde woman's face over her own. So pick me. Choose me. Love me. Santana was well known in her community for making these catfish accounts, and those directly around her 
knew that she often used these accounts to trick men into sending her money. It seemed that Janie enjoyed the feeling of being pursued, and would routinely seek out relationships with men even though she was married, which she had technically been eight times. Janie married her first husband, Anselmo Uresti, when she was just 17 and he was 20. They would have one son together, but would eventually divorce after 10 years. Five years later, Janie would go on to marry her second husband, Patrick Roca. Patrick owned a furniture store in the Houston area, and whilst buying furniture, the two had fallen in love. However, like Rudy's abduction, that never actually happened. Patrick didn't know Janie Santana, and despite legal documents saying the two had been married, he had no idea who Janie Santana even was. While she was still legally married with Patrick without his knowledge or consent, in 1998, Janie would meet and marry her third husband, a man by the name of John Paul Gonzalez. However, two years later, this marriage would be annulled when Janie told the court that she was still married to Patrick when she'd gotten married to John, making her second marriage invalid. This statement would go against her claims she would make later, claiming that she wasn't the person who had claimed to be married to Patrick and that her identity had been stolen by another woman who stole her driver's license in a bar. While seemingly married to both Patrick and Paul, Janie would go on to marry another man, Roberto Larios, in 1999. Roberto first appeared in court in 2010, when he filed a petition for declaratory judgment and division of jointly owned assets. In his petition, Roberto swore that he and Santana were not married, but that she owed him money, including for his investment in an unsuccessful Santana's sports bar. Santana responded with a cross petition that insisted that she and Larios were indeed married, and had been since sometime around 1999, in the midst of her two previous marriages. She also tried to assert that Rudy was Roberto's son, which was obviously untrue, but that would not be the last time that Santana would attempt to use her own son to get child support out of the men around her. In 2013, their marriage was declared legally void. In 2002, Janie would get married to John T. Rodriguez, who would unfortunately pass away five years later. When John passed, Santana stated that she was Rodriguez's wife and that his estate should be passed on to her. She also claimed that he had been Rudy's adopted father and that he looked at Rudy as his own son. There were no documents of John's that alluded to any of her claims, but Janie would eventually be awarded the estate with the guarantee that she would drop the claim that John was Rudy's adoptive father and therefore deserved child support from his estate. She then married Suka Diaz in 2009, who she is seemingly still married to, but that is far from her last marriage. In 2012, she would marry Gilbert Kiraz, an Air National Guardsman from Arizona. However, the marriage only lasted 10 days, as Gilbert immediately moved to have his marriage to Janie voided, given the fact that she was still technically married to multiple other men. The court battle would last two years, and Gilbert's legal counsel would point out her history of marrying men while still married to others. Janie would later state in court that she had never actually married anyone at the same time. Rather, her identity had been stolen multiple times throughout her adult life, and whoever had stolen it simply enjoyed marrying men. Unsurprisingly, that defense didn't work. Her latest husband at the time of writing this is Robert Ortega, who she married nine months after Rudy's disappearance. According to Insider, Ortega left a wife of 20 years for Santana, although it's unclear if they met in person before the wedding. Ortega and Santana shared two houses, the home she inherited from Rodriguez and Ortega's home in Humble, Texas. Though they haven't gotten legally divorced as of time of recording, Robert allegedly left Janie after running into Rudy and finding out that he wasn't actually missing. As of today, he lives in Arizona and is in a new relationship. Those closest to Janie would describe her as a con man and a liar. She was constantly looking for new and inventive ways to attract attention, and didn't care if it was really her who was getting it. She had feigned illness before and lied about Rudy's parentage multiple times, so people knew better than to take her at her word. But no one thought she would go as far as to lie about her son's disappearance, but it seems that is exactly what she did. According to the Houston Police Department and multiple private investigators who have been involved with the case since 2015, Rudy did go missing March 6, 2015. He was tired of living at home and wanted to get away from his mother to go live on his own, so he packed a bag and left. However, he returned home two days later, only to be told by Janie that he was now a fugitive of the law. She convinced her son that because he had run away from home and she had reported him missing, he was now considered a criminal. She repeatedly stated that because he hadn't really been kidnapped or abducted, he had wasted police resources, and if the police found him, he would be arrested. 
This scared Rudy, who had just wanted to start his adult life and gain some of his own independence. Again, according to other family members, Rudy had the mental capacity of a child and could not understand things the way an average teenager his age would. But Janie comforted Rudy, telling him that she would protect him from the police. He just needed to do exactly what she said. Janie told her son that they had to make it seem as if he had disappeared, and to help sell the lie, he would have to stay inside the home full time and hide whenever guests were over at the house. His room was boarded up with locks, and he would be locked in there for long stretches of time, making sure that no one else could come into contact with him. After Rudy agreed to stay in the home, Janie continued to pretend that her son was missing, asking for volunteers to come out and search for her son when she knew he was sitting at home. At the same time, she tried to get the investigation off of her trail by repeatedly giving them false information. When Rudy was initially reported missing, Janie gave the police and Texas EquiSearch the wrong birthday, stating that Rudy was 17 years old, when he was really 18. When asked why she did this by a private investigator, she claimed she had lied about his age on purpose because she felt that it would make people more empathetic. Similarly, when she was asked to provide a recent photo of Rudy for the search, instead of choosing the last photo she had taken of him, she used a photo of him that was taken when he was 14. Again, when asked by the investigators why she wanted to use the photo, she told them it would make people care about the case more. When searchers found the asthma inhaler in a backpack at the scene of the disappearance, Janie claimed that they had been her sons, and that he would have never dropped those items normally. But after these items were forwarded to the police, they found that the bag belonged to a local middle schooler, whose name and homework were found on various items inside. It was also found that Rudy never had an inhaler, as he didn't have asthma. Multiple private investigators stumbled across the case over the years and donated their time to the Farias family, hoping that they could help bring Rudy home. But each and every one of them encountered troubling red flags from the moment they became involved. According to Barbara and Martin Renteria, a husband and wife investigation team, they routinely spoke to Janie at her home, and they immediately noted that there were no dogs in the home. Not only that, it looked as if there had never been dogs in the home at all. When they asked Janie about the dogs that had been such a pivotal part of the story, she would try to brush past their inquiry. But when they pressed on the issue, she usually stated she didn't know where they were and what they got up to. They noted the padlocks on some of the doors in the hallway, and the fact that Janie would never let them interview her mother, Rosa, about Rudy's disappearance. This was likely because Rosa was living with Janie and Rudy, and would tell family members that Rudy wasn't actually missing, that he had been in the home the whole time, and he was completely fine. According to Rudy's aunt, Janie's sister, whenever Rosa did this, Janie would get upset and claim their mother was losing it in her old age. Barbara and Martin were also allowed to search Rudy's room shortly after he was reported missing, and while searching, they came across multiple pieces of paper that Rudy had filled out. Later on, Janie showed the Renterias a letter that she claimed she had found among Rudy's things. What exactly this letter said is unknown, but the Renterias claimed the letter was supposedly Rudy stating he was running away from home. This letter also raised a lot of red flags for the investigators, as they had seen Rudy's handwriting on various items in the home and in his room, and this handwriting did not match. Janie would go on to tell private investigators that she hadn't given the note to police, because had they known that Rudy ran away on his own, the public wouldn't care about finding him. She claimed that the public would be more sympathetic towards her if they believed he was kidnapped or trafficked. Later on, Janie would produce a witness who claimed that she had seen Rudy struggle with a group of older kids in their neighborhood, and went so far as to have this girl speak at a fundraising event organized by the community. This young, teenage girl would never speak to the police, as Janie never informed police that there was a witness to her son's abduction, but she would speak to the Renterias. According to the P.I. couple, her story was incoherent. When they pressed for certain details, the young girl would change her story completely, and it was clear within a few minutes that she was lying. Barbara said, quote, she couldn't hold the story together, so she just walked away. This was someone who Janie had forced into talking to us, but that would be a reoccurring theme in the investigation. Shortly thereafter, when talking to Ryan Grayston, another PI involved in the case, Janie told him there was a woman in Mexico who was holding on to Rudy for a cartel. She claimed that this woman was likely involved in a drug trafficking ring, and she had found her on Facebook and had begun private messaging her. Janie provided Ryan with this woman's contact information, and he called her. However, she told a different story. According to Grayston, the cartel woman said, quote, I told Janie I didn't want to be involved in her scam. End quote. 
Despite this lead not panning out, Janie still brought it up during another fundraising event where the proceeds would go directly to her. On another occasion, Santana shared with him communications from her son's purported traffickers in Tijuana, Mexico. However, Grayston noted that the messages were incredibly suspicious and fit Janie's own way of texting. Every private investigator who came into contact with the case felt like something was deeply amiss with Janie's story, and they worried that she knew more than she was letting on, but they had no idea that she was the one holding her son captive. The police, however, didn't seem to notice any red flags, even when, in 2018, a tip came in from a relative of Farias, stating that he was not missing and was still living at home. According to police, they responded to the call by searching the Farias family home, but they were unable to locate Rudy. They were, however, able to find Dolph. As time went on, it became less and less practical to keep Rudy locked up in the home without being seen. And so, to avoid detection, Janie introduced her son to the police and to the neighbors as Dolph, and told them that he was the older nephew who was living with her. Most of these neighbors had moved in after Rudy had gone missing, and given the age difference between the boy on the missing persons flyer and the man in person, they didn't question Dolph or Janie. More twists and turns are coming in by the minute concerning that 25-year-old man found alive after he went missing eight years ago. And as those new details come in, there are many more questions we have about where he's been all these years. ABC 13's Brooke Taylor has been speaking with neighbors who are stunned to find out the man who they say lives on their street was ever a missing person in the first place. Yeah, these neighbors were just completely shocked because they never even knew that Rudy Farias was missing, let alone for eight years. They tell me that they knew him as Dolph, short for Rudolph. They told me they see him often, they text with him, they even hang out with him. Like, I'm confused right now. I'm like, what's going on? These neighbors are shocked after seeing reports that missing 25-year-old Rudy Farias was found after missing for eight long years. Court records reveal his mother lives a few houses down from them, and they tell us her son lives there and they hang out with him often. He used to come in my garage my and chill with my, chill my cousin, my son, my daughter. She's at work right now, but that yeah, boy ain't been missing since he was no. Both say they've spoken to him in the last five months and even text. Other neighbors say they've seen him living there for years. We were chilling, laughing, some good days, time. Some days he goes to the park and sit in the park around the corner by himself. Houston police say they got a call on Thursday about a man sleeping outside a church in Magnolia Park. He had something on him with a family member's identification, police say, and that's how they were able to contact his mom. Then Texas for the Missing tweeted out over the weekend that man was Rudy Farias, who had been missing since 2015 when he didn't return back from a walk with his dogs. His mother shared pictures with ABC 13 of her son at the hospital, telling us he was found with cuts and bruises and even cried to me over the phone, saying she believed her son had been kidnapped and hasn't seen him in years. His mother told officials at the time of his disappearance that he suffered from depression and PTSD since his brother died in a motorcycle accident in 2011, something these neighbors say he spoke about. He said he had a, lost a brother in a motorcycle accident. I know when you're thinking about his brother, he wouldn't come, he really wouldn't come hang out. He'd go sit back there in the back of the woods by himself. And now they're trying to wrap their heads around why he or his mom would ever say he's been missing for the past eight years. It wouldn't be until after Farias returned home that the neighbors realized that Rudy and Dolph were the same person and quickly spoke up about the situation. Shortly after news broke that Rudy was found, Janie contacted a local activist named Grizzy. Grizzy had reported on the disappearance on her social media, and in the comments section, people were pointing out how Janie's story didn't make sense. The photo she had posted with her statement on Rudy coming back home didn't appear to have been taken in a local Houston hospital, and multiple people found the story to be suspicious. Grizzy would later say, quote, The first thing she tells me is I see a lot of people talking shit about me on your page. I thought it was odd that that's the first thing she told me. Instead of, my son is hurting, he's at the hospital. She was more worried about how the media perceived her. She thought with me that I would tell everybody to lay off of her, unquote. Santana later invited Grizzy to speak with her in person, 
at the hospital Rudy was recuperating at, but her behavior was even more alarming. Instead of caring for her son's well-being, she was preoccupied with how her in-person appearance varied from the way she purported to look online. She said, I'm worried. There are a bunch of cameras. I don't want them recording me. She was very worried about being on camera because she's posting pictures of herself that are not hers. Given the media attention on her son's return home, Janie knew her picture was going to be plastered on articles and in the news. However, she had been using other people's images on her social media to scam unsuspecting men for years, and she didn't want her scheme to be found out. Almost immediately, the activist knew something was extremely wrong with the situation, and felt as if Janie knew more than she was saying, but it was through Grizzy that another person would become involved in the case, that being Quinnell X. Nearly a week after Rudy had been found on the steps of the church, Janie would be recorded frantically packing her car in the middle of the day. Reportedly, the neighbors suspected that she was going to try and flee to Mexico, and when they spoke to her, she claimed that the police were getting ready to arrest her for aiding and abetting her son. From a distance, neighbors took video of Rudy Farias's mother loading up a car in her driveway Tuesday night. When he first went missing, he didn't, he didn't uh, report it to the police. And uh, they're trying to say that he might have done some crimes, which he didn't. And now they want to arrest me because they said I was hiding him. When Janie stated this, the police had not spoken to Rudy, as she continued to state he was nonverbal and too traumatized to talk. And she was given no reason to believe that they were going to arrest her. They had tried to arrange a time for them to speak, but no threats had been made against her or her son by law enforcement. Shortly after packing her car, Janie would take her son to a local hotel. She went on to claim they were forced out of their house due to persistent threats on their lives and that she was being vilified in the press. The next day, July 5th, the police would arrive to interview Rudy at the hotel they were staying at. Janie requested that Quinnell X join them, as he had been incredibly empathetic towards her on social media. She seemed to believe that she could use him as a character witness in the room and that should she get uncomfortable with the questions the police were asking, he would defend her. However, that is not what happened. According to Quinnell, while Janie was in the room, Rudy refused to speak. It was only when she left for a brief moment that he opened up. The following is Quinnell's version of events, as stated to reporters directly after leaving the hotel interview. So my parents received an emergency phone call to get over here for this meeting with the detectives. Rudy's mother and Rudy. And so I dropped everything I was doing and made it as fast as I possibly could. And uh, I spent about an hour and 20 minutes one on one with Rudy and with one of the detectives. I heard horrific things from that young man. And I did not want him to see me start shedding tears, but I couldn't hold back the tears because of the things he was saying to us, the detective and myself. No child, no child should ever be treated like that by your own mother. This young man said that when he initially ran away, he came back two days later and she told him that he had to hide, that he was going to get in trouble and they were going to arrest him for running away and that he had to continue hiding. And so she hid him out for a while, then brought him back to the house and hid him in the home. And initially, whenever the investigators would come, she would hide him in the house. And um, he kept saying, I don't want her to go to prison. I don't want her to get in trouble. I don't want her to go to jail. And so we asked him, why did you run away? And he said he just got tired of her not respecting his boundaries. Pausing here for a moment, Quinnell is not speaking about the first time Rudy ran away from home, all the way back in 2015. He is talking about how Rudy was found in 2023, as he had run away from home again. More on that in a bit. And she said that he wanted his own life. And his exact word was, I was tired of living like a slave. She would take him to work with her and he would do the required work she was supposed to do. And a lot of the responsibilities of her job was on him. And he, he went on to say that 
what troubled him the most was her crossing his personal space boundaries. He said that she would make him sleep in the bed with her. And he said that she made him play daddy. He said that she, that he didn't like getting in the bed with her. That he would try to sneak out of the bed and sometime hide under the bed, but she told him he had to be her husband. That's a damn shame, man. A little boy said she was the one providing drugs to him for years. Hallucinate, hallucination drugs, mushrooms, etc. And that the reason why he was left, he was just tired of her crossing his boundaries. When he would shower, she would come and pull the shower curtain back and stare at him and then she would make him bathe her with the soap. And he ran away this time because he was tired. Well, now, he's been doing this for many years. How emotional has today been with this case? It's a goddamn shame. I ain't never in my life heard of a mother doing to a child what this woman did. Were you at all there when the mother was questioned? And then, yes. And what was her reaction? When yes. And she, I knew something was wrong with the story. When she was questioned, when he got, when, he went, when they found him, he had her credit card in his pocket. She just canceled that credit card two and a half years ago. So if he's been missing for eight years, how the hell he get your credit card in, your, in his pocket when they found him from two and a half years ago? What she mean? And he said to us that she gave him that credit card so he could go and buy her certain but, things. But with the other allegations, what was her response to those allegations? She hadn't even heard them because we had to remove her from the room. But did she, so she hasn't been questioned about that? Can you describe her demeanor and his demeanor during questioning? When she was in the room, he wouldn't say nothing. He wouldn't say one word when she was in the room. But the minute she left the room and we were allowed to talk to a young man, he asked. He said, can I speak with Mr. X by myself? Can I talk to Quanell by myself? And the detective was like, well, can one of us stay in the room? And he was like, okay, but, but I'll talk to him. When she left, he, when he first came here, he was holding on to her. He wouldn't talk to her. He wouldn't say one word to anybody. Like he was petrified. But the minute he got alone by himself, he slowly calmed down. And he slowly began to talk very coherently and specific details. This is a man in his mid-20s. People might wonder, why not run away from this situation? Why not get yourself out of it? Did he give you any explanation about that? I honestly believe, based on what he said to us, she was drugging the hell out of this kid. And she convinced him that he was in trouble for initially running away and that law enforcement wanted to arrest him and put him in jail for running away. She had convinced him that all type of agencies were looking for him to put him in jail. He was in plain sight, according to you, in that he would take her to work. No, he, would, he would go to work with her. Right, he would take He would stay at the job with her. She would take him to work. Where did she work and where was he doing this it was, work? It was some kind of security job or something like that. Where they were at, I don't know, but it was a security type job, how a nighttime he, security watch type he, job. How did he end up in the church? We still can't. He admit that, that, he, that he had took mushrooms, okay? And two weeks before this, a week of, may, may not even fish the whole two weeks, her car was stolen, okay? When her car was stolen, she didn't know how the car was stolen, but the keys were in the car. 
and he stole the car. That's when he got into the accident in the car. And it was him that got into the accident in that car. What was the story? I mean, this is eight years he was reported missing. What's the story that he's been, I spoke to neighbors who said um, he went by Dalt, but he never kind of told anyone she, what happened. What was his story? Because she had convinced him that he was in so much trouble for initially running away. And she gave this boy serious drugs to the point to where this boy needs extensive professional help. What was How he? did he stay missing for so long? I mean, eight years. He was allowed to um, visit with some of the neighbors under an assumed name. She believed that after so many years, people had forgotten about the case and that under an assumed name and convinced him to use that name, nobody would put two and two together. But he never told any of the people that he was with what was happening? Never told anybody what was going on. And let me say this. That young man's body have scars all over it. Slice wounds from here, from literally his forearm to his wrist. All type of scars on this kid. And he said that she often locked him in the room that she would give him the drugs and lock him in the room. And there's a whole lot of uh, mental health issues there, I believe, induced because of the drugs that this young man was well, given. At any point during this process today, did you see the mother detained by HPD? <sighs> they took her to another room and kept her there for a minute after he had confided with us what was said. I know they were on the phone with the DA's office and their superiors about this case, but I want everybody to know something. This young boy was not kidnapped by some strangers and he got away and they found him. That's not the case here. You know, this happened on Thursday and we're nearly a week later and investigators waited almost a week to speak to him. Hearing the story that you heard, is it a concern that they waited this long to hear from him given the story that you were told? It seems like he's had eight years of dealing with this and now another week. I was shocked that they have not done more. I was shocked that they had not executed a search warrant on the home. I was shocked by that. And I said, don't you all think you need to get busy and execute a search warrant on that home? And the young man made it crystal clear to us that that's where he was, in the house. But he was living under this fake assumed name. You what think you... police failed in this situation? Oh, big time. No doubt about it. Absolutely they did. Because there, was, there, was, there were several instances where calls were made about him to law enforcement and they did not properly follow up and follow through based on the history of that address. Because she hadn't changed addresses. And some residents were saying this morning that she brought bags and she was trying to leave. Do we know something about she that? She was trying to do what? She was trying to leave the she house. She was trying to leave the house? She did leave the house. So she was trying and to escape? She, left, she did leave the house and she was trying to get away from the house, yes. Why was she at this hotel? Uh, she said she felt that she was not safe going home because she had been receiving threats. What now is the police investigation over? Where are they? I can't say what's, at what state their investigation is. But what I can say, it ain't no way in hell that woman shouldn't be locked up immediately. And that boy needs to go to the best drug rehab and best psychological mental health facility that we can find for him. He's a good kid. He's a good kid. That kid was just severely abused. And, and what was the mother's reaction when you brought these stories to her? I couldn't go back in the presence at that point. The police felt it was just best that she and I not speak again. Does she, because so she, I was bitter. Is she aware of these that the son told you? Yes, yeah, she's aware. And then she goes back in there and tries to tell him and she don't even know that was recorded. Tell him, tell him that you made it all up. That it was just a lie. 
you said she would he she would ask him to play daddy. Can you just um, she was sexually abused. She would ask him to play daddy. She told him that he had to be the husband. She would force him to sleep in the bed with her. And he was forced to sleep at times in the beds with no clothes on. Was anything and ever done? Yes, but I don't want to talk about the kissing and all of that stuff. And, but he was telling you that there was some sort of sexual action that was happening between him and his... Let me ask you a question. If your mother tongue kissing you in the bed with her naked, what the hell is that? I mean, damn, dude, do, do we have to go that far? That's, that's, what, the, that's what happened. This is sick. L, do you this ain't normal. This is sick. L, if these allegations are true, and I understand the position you're in, if they are true, how long before you think there's an arrest? based on what that young man said to me in front of the detective. I don't see why she's not in handcuffs right now. I don't see why she's not in handcuffs right now. Thank you. Thank you. To summarize, Quinnell stated, Rudy admitted to being in the home the eight years that he was missing, that Janie forced him to come back to work with her and do her job for no pay, that she regularly supplied him with hallucinogenic drugs to keep him docile, would watch him in the shower, and force him to sleep in her bed naked and kiss her. Though he was careful not to go any further, it's clear that this is a case of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Moreover, after Rudy told Quinnell and a detective this information, it was relayed to Janie, who, upon seeing her son, was recorded telling him to say he was lying, and that he just made that up. As of time of writing, no recording has been produced, and the Houston Police Department have not confirmed this story. After Quinnell's interview, the police stated that they interviewed Farias and Santana, but found no probable cause to arrest her, and put out a public statement that Farias was safe and with his mother by choice. Despite the police department's claims, Rudy's aunt, Pauline Sanchez Rodriguez, told multiple outlets that, quote, Farias won't answer his mother's calls and that he doesn't want to see his mom, unquote. On July 6, 2023, the Houston Police Department would hold their own press conference about the case where they did their best to avoid answering any questions in depth. However, when asked by a reporter if the detective who was in the room with Quinnell and Rudy heard Rudy claim his mother had sexually abused him, the detective stated that that did not happen, and that, quote, he is trained to look for probable cause, unquote, and that he didn't see any there. Following the press conference, Quinnell X put on his own press conference, this time in front of the Farias home. Liars! Oh, man. That man heard everything that I heard. These are blessed waters from my mom. I'm standing here speaking the truth of what Rudy said to me. And I'm standing here fighting for that young man. We begged, I begged the detective, don't allow Rudy to go home with this woman. Don't allow Rudy to leave with this woman. I begged them to do something to stop him. I said to the detective, all three of them, after what you and I just heard in that room with that young man, how in the hell can you allow that boy to leave with that woman? And the detective said to me, because he is an adult, there's not a lot we can do about it. The detective, I also said to him, I said, sir, you know everything that young boy just told us. You cannot allow him to leave with her. That young boy told us how she would lock him in the room and leave him locked in there. That young boy told us how she would give him drugs, mushrooms as he called them. That young boy talked about how the drugs would cause him to hallucinate. She lied and told me when I first talked to her that the Hispanic young man that was seen here was her ex-boyfriend. And then when we were in the meeting with the detectives, she said it was her nephew. She'd been telling lies for years. So you mean to tell me Houston Police Department, 
This woman can tell multiple lies to law enforcement. She can raise money all on GoFundMe pages. I talked with the investigator for at length today who worked on this case for years, the private investigator. She would raise money for Miss Jenny. And one time she said when she raised the money for her, she only came for five minutes, picked up the $2,000 and drove off and left and didn't even thank the people who was raising the money on behalf of Rudy to look for him. I cannot believe and I refuse to believe that there's not a single charge that they can come up with to put this woman in jail so a judge can tell her you can have no contact with the victim just like you do in domestic violence cases. If a man gets arrested for putting his hands on a wife, God forbid, they tell him that you cannot have any contact with the victim. Rudy is a victim. The reason why he was so willing to lie is because she had convinced him that the police had warrants out for his arrest because he had ran away. And she told him, because you ran away and they were looking for you and they spent resources looking for you, that you have a warrant for your arrest. And if they catch you, you're going to jail. She had convinced the young man to wear an assumed name because he thought he was in trouble for running away. Rudy also said to us, me and the detective, on more than one occasion, he put his head down in tears right before he began to talk about him playing daddy at her request and he got to be the husband. He has to be the husband is what he said. He said, I don't want my mama to go to prison. I don't want my mama to go to jail. On yesterday, when the question was asked, was there a sexual relationship? The sergeant lied in his response. And then the next question was, was there a sexual relationship between the mother and her son? They refused to answer that question and said he's a victim and we protect all sexual assault victims. See, they know what I'm saying is the truth. Mm -hmm. That dirty, low down damn cop was right there with me when Rudy said everything that he said. Mm -hmm. Just go back and look at the press conference. Why, did you, why didn't you say, well, from what we know, there was no sexual relationship? You so freely saying that there was no sexual abuse reported, so what are you suggesting? Because he was of age, he gave consent? Is that what you're trying to suggest? Let me tell you something. Rudy is a victim. And for HPD to suggest on any level that that young boy may be involved in this scheme, that's wrong. That boy wasn't involved in no scheme. That woman a straight up monster. I'm telling you straight up. That's what that woman is. Woman sit there and told Grizzly and I both multiple lies. Multiple lies. And then get in the room with the detective and she starts singing a whole nother song. Rudy, in my opinion, his safety is in danger. Mm -hmm. Until he can be removed and placed with loving family or put in a facility where he can receive the type of mental health treatment and drug detox treatment that he needs, he needs that help. And right now he's not getting that help. And what further angers me, you know, for that cop to hear about all the drug abuse and he ain't do nothing to get that boy no help. Should have called, I say, man, call, call the paramedics. Take this kid to the hospital. Look at him. Then she told a big lie when we first got there. And I hate to put you on the spot, Grizzy, but if it wasn't for Grizzy, I would have never got involved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. If it wasn't for Grizzy, that mother never would have called me. But she called me thinking I was gonna help cover up with the lies she would tell and defend her. Man, let me tell you something. Everyone should be praying for Rudy and should be outraged with how this is being handled. That woman should be under the jail. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you for a fact what this young man said to me, and I'm gonna leave it at this. HPD, don't try me. 
because I got it on record what he said to me. But for the sake of the victim, I'll respect that young man's dignity as my lawyers told me to. But if you try me with your lies again, I'll let everybody hear what that young man said. But I want to respect that young man's privacy because what he went through should be for him to expose to a therapist and not for me to share with the public, but I covered my basis. I'll take your questions. Why do you think HPD is lying? I think HPD is embarrassed that they encountered Rudy on several occasions and did not do their due diligence. When they came to this address, had they done just some basic fundamental research, they would have seen that a child been missing from this address just years before. When they encountered him on other occasions, they didn't do their due diligence. They let that boy keep going with his mother. When neighbors would call in, when family would call in and say, hey, look, we got this tip about Rudy, they never even followed through. And in fact, they have to tell the whole world now why when Rudy was found, you waited eight days, eight days to question him. In fact, they wasn't gonna even question Rudy. Let me be clear about that. They had decided that they were not gonna question Rudy after the mother told them he's nonverbal. The mother told me and the detectives right in front of Grizzy Oh, he's nonverbal. He can't talk. And so I pulled up a chair and I sat down to, next to him and he was holding his mother's leg and crouched all over and she had covered him up with a blanket. And I said, little brother, can you look at me? And he raised his head up and he looked. He said, I know you. I say, you do? He said, I know you. You, Mr. X. I said, wow, little brother, you speaking now. Am I lying, Grizzy? Nope. Then I said, well, young man, can, can I shake your hand? He put his hand out, he's shaking like this, like a leaf blowing in the wind. And I shook that young man's hand. I said, can you sit up and talk to me? And he looked at his mama. Then she said, no, he gonna have a panic attack. No, he gonna have a breakdown. And I said, I think he'll be okay. I said, young fella, you'll be okay? He said, so I helped him up. And we set him in a chair. Then his mama said, well, we need to leave because I think he gonna have a panic attack. Then the detective said this, well, okay, call us when you think he's better. Call us when you think he's able to talk. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, at first he was nonverbal, but he talking right now. I said, give him a chance. And detective said, well, if it's okay with him. And I said, Rudy, would you mind talking to us? He said, yeah. He said, but I said, okay, just ask Grizzly. I said, okay, talk to the detective. I got up to walk out. Rudy grabbed my hand and said, no, I want him to stay. So for all of you people who putting it out there that I put myself into this case, his mama called me and Rudy demanded that I stay. And so I said, okay, I sat down next to him. And we asked the mother to leave. She didn't want to leave. We said, ma'am, it's important that you leave so we can see if he'll talk, he might open up. So she said, okay, she left. We started talking to him. She came back three minutes later, bamming on the door. We opened the door. She said, is he having a panic attack? We said, no, he's fine. Look at him. He In an interview with Fox 7, Rudy's cousin, Michelle Rodriguez said, quote, they are covering up what they knew years ago and they didn't want to come out. Prior to Rudy's disappearance, his so-called disappearance, his mother had been seen by my late grandma causing abuse to Rudy sexually, physically, mentally. This did not just start when Janie reported Rudy missing. Janie needs to be brought in. It's all going to come out. You can't hide. Nothing is going to be hidden. So whatever you think you can hide, good luck, it's coming out.
unquote. Rudy's aunt and Janie's sister, Pauline, went on to accuse the Houston Police Department of covering for Janie, claiming that Janie is still friends with many officers who are on the force, stemming from the fact that Rudy's father had worked there for 21 years before his death. As of today, it has been reported that Rudy is now staying with a family friend and is no longer taking Janie's calls. However, this statement has not been corroborated, and there are multiple reports that Janie has seen Rudy and has been seen going in and out of the family friend's home. But on July 11th, 2023, Rudy himself would speak publicly for the first time. Before we begin, according to Rudy's extended family, and Quinnell X, Rudy has been horrifically abused for the past eight years and fed hallucinogenic drugs in order to keep him docile. Please keep that in mind while listening to this interview. He's clearly not mentally well. Are you shocked at how much attention this is? Yeah, a lot. It's, it's a lot of attention. It kind of gets me overwhelmed, you know. But other than that, you know, I just try to stay positive, you know, just try to keep my mentality straight and honest and true and just spread positivity and kindness, you know. So the world thought you were missing for eight years. Where, where were you? Where have you been? Uh, just at home. Just stuck at home, you know. If somebody would come over, my mom would just tell me stay in the room, you know. Keep the door locked, don't let them in, don't make any sounds, don't do anything, you know. Tell us about what it was like living there. Were you allowed to leave the room? Was she holding you there against your will? She never, like, locked me in or, you know, like, handcuffed me or anything like that. You know, I had free will to leave. It's just, it just felt like brainwashing, honestly. Like, just, it just kept confusing me, just the way, you know, she would manipulate me into saying, like, Oh, you're gonna get arrested because you have a speeding ticket or something, like something minor, something innocent, and then it would just, and then it would just kind of escalate into just people just, sorry, just, you're it's good. Okay. It's just, um, Take your time. Yeah, it just escalated from there, from you know just wanting to get away from home, just be free, live my own life, arguing all the time, and then we eventually just went into just. She locked me in there pretty much mentally, just that she was my only parent. She was the only person I ever really had besides my brother. So when I lost my brother, I didn't have anybody to teach me how to live, you know, how to have confidence or trust in myself or anything, you know. So I just depended on my mom all my life. What had you been doing for those eight years? Just, um trying to study the best I can online, you know, understand how the world works, you know, understand different cultures, different religions, different everything, because my life, I just believe that we should stop putting labels on everything and just understand the communities and the prosperity and the growth and the positivity, because there's just too much fighting, there's too much anger, there's too much depression and mental health problems in the world. And we, yeah, it's just... We just need to spread more positivity because all of it, everything around us, it's just, it's an algorithm that they control through the social media and through the colors and just everything, you know? Like if you see something white, like a white wall or a white pillowcase or a white car driving around the place, you know, you'll, you'll just understand that like you're just trying to have a positive thought and then you'll look at something white and get sidetracked and you'll get distracted about stuff and things and then you'll find stuff like a pink wall or something or pink whatever and then you'll just be reminded of you know somebody trying to help you prosperity you know just somebody loving people and red people confuse that for anger or hate and it's only anger or hate these type of things if you look at it that way you know you know police said a lot of times that you were 17 when this happened and you're an adult you spoke a little bit about this about some of the family um, trauma you've had growing up talk about the fact that although you're an adult, how difficult it was for you to be in this situation and maybe not be able to get out of. It, just, it felt like Stockholm Syndrome, honestly. Like, just held against my will mentally, not physically, just constantly, like, she was bombarding me with negative thoughts. And, like, every time I come around her, she just makes me, it's like little triggers just pop up, and it's like... If I'm trying to get away from my mom, I'll hear a random noise and it'll be like a little reminder in my head, like, don't do that, don't say this, or, you know, just little things like 
she's putting ideas or thoughts into my head whenever I'm just trying to, you know, just understand the world. Do you think your mom took advantage of you? Heavily. How does that feel? I mean, I can't imagine you said your okay. mom's really the only person in your family you have. How was that that you felt your own mom took it, advantage? It was, it's like I lived in prison. It's like I lived in a jail my whole life. I just wanted to be free. I wanted to have my own job. I just, I just wanted to live my life. Just, I just wanted to um, just love somebody, you know, have somebody else that would actually love me because I wasn't sure what love was. I struggled understanding my emotions. I don't know when I'm sad and that I'm sending out negative energy. I don't understand when I'm happy and sending out positive energy. I just, the only way I was under, Understanding how to communicate with people was online and even then you can't trust everything you see online because Half the time people are just making their own assumptions and spinning what they want and just I can't ever speak my truth Because everybody wants to assume things. Can you go into the brainwashing? What would she say to you? Would she say something would happen if you were to leave her home? It wasn't that it's just after I left I started to understand that all of it's just an algorithm it's literally all an algorithm. If you look at something black, you understand that they understand. If you look at something white, it'll confuse you when you're trying to go in a positive direction. If you look at something red, it'll remind you of love. If you look at green, it'll remind you of, you know, like grounding people that are there for you and stuff, you know? Did, and, did you feel stuck? And, and what was she doing exactly that kept you hidden? It's just every time I would try to leave or, you know, try to do things for myself, like I want to go get my own money, I want to go work a different job, I want to do this and that, they would always just come right back around to just don't do that or it's bad, don't do that, you know, like the cops are going to come out, they're going to do this, they're going to arrest you if you're driving the car without a license or this and that, and just like... Oh, how do you expect me to get a license to drive a car if I can't even go out? Why if you... all I do is work 12-hour shifts seven days a week and I get $60, like, I don't understand how that's fair. Why do you think she wanted to keep you hidden? I, I don't know. It all started just because I had a speeding ticket. I went, like, 70 and 55 trying to go to work, and then... When that all started, it's just like I wasn't able to have a life. I was starting to start working and growing and, you know, provide for myself. And then after that happened, I just, I couldn't do it. I, I think the question everyone has is why your mom would lie and say that you've been missing for eight years. Did she ever tell you, or did you ever ask mom, why are we pretending that I'm I, missing? And that's the thing, when it comes to the real small details like that, I just can't, I don't remember. It's like it just blocks it out, like she's blocking it out for me or something. It's like I just, I just want to remember the facts. I just want to understand, you know, who I am and what I'm trying to do and just try to live my life the way I want to and not how she wants me to. Were, were you questioning your mom? Like, mom, why am I doing yeah, this? Yeah, I would always ask her stuff like, when am I going to get a job? When am I going to have my own car? When am I going to be able to make my own decisions? When am I going to be able to just go out and be free? Like, why can't we just go to the police station why can't I just get a lawyer why can't I just do that and she's like oh you can't get a lawyer because it's too much money we can't do that because it's too much money everything was always just money 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 it's a constantly money if you had to guess why she was doing this was she making money from you being missing as far as you know I don't know I think somebody at one point mentioned something about an original GoFundMe page and then she my mom wanted to say something about like one of my aunts or something was like stole all the sodas or some but meanwhile where's all the money that they raised you know like and where did that go to helping find me so we have video we actually fox 26 we interviewed your mother while you were in the hospital in 10 years ago in 2012 uh -huh. what happened why were you in the hospital and and i guess it was mentioned to our reporter at the time that you had cancer um, I had a tumor on my heel at one point, but that was irrelevant. Originally, I think all that had started because she wanted me to fake taking some, like, a bottle of uh, Tylenol or, like, Aleve PM or something, you know, sleeping pills. And then she wanted to fake me going to the hospital and 
she pretty much just forced me to go in the ER and be like, hey, you know, act like you're sick and you're overdosing and, and This was before they, you were missing? Yes, sir. And why? Why was this happening? I, I don't even remember. I think it was something to do with school. I was depressed and I was cutting my wrist when I was, you know, getting sad. I didn't have an idea, like an idea how to, you know, understand my emotions. It was after my brother passed away. I didn't know what, how to deal with pain and depression, so I would just literally just rip a Coke can open and just run it on my wrist like a cheese grater just to feel something. Your brother was a big part of your life, the yes. one who passed away. Yeah. Talk to us about that, and was that a major part in this, how you were feeling with depending on your mom? Yes, ma'am. He would take care of me. You know, he would take me to and from school. He would pick me up. He would get me McDonald's. You know, he'd just play little jokes on me and stuff. And after he had passed away, I just wasn't able to, you know, love myself or anything anymore. I just. I wasn't able to have somebody like a father figure, you know, he was my brother, but I never had a dad. I only had stepdads. I didn't, I didn't know how to grow up. I didn't know what I was doing as I was growing up. I didn't understand how to take care of myself, how to wash myself, how to make doctor's appointments, how to do anything, because I never had a chance. What would you have to say to police that say, well, he was an adult? What do you mean? It seems like in this case, you didn't have the support there that you needed, and um, police seem so focused on your age that you were 17, which is an adult um, in Texas. But can you talk about the fact that yes, you were an adult, but the mindset that you've been in? Yeah, it was just like a constant brainwashing, like the Stockholm type of syndrome, where it's just, you know, you just fall in love with your, your captive and just want to take care of them, do this and that, you know, like, it would just constantly just be me trying to help and just take care of my mom, do whatever she needs because I cared about her and she's the only person I had. Did your mom, over this last eight years, did she say anything or, or like, is there anything that sticks out in your mind that that bothers you or you, that you remember conversations with her that just, I don't know, I used to, have to sleep in her bed sometimes. I don't remember why, just like next to her. It wouldn't be anything sexual or anything like that. I wouldn't lie about that because there's plenty of people that need honest truths when it comes to those things. That just muddies the water to lie about those type of things. That's where I said the media, they like to twist my words and confuse things. I never said anything bad about her in that regard, but you know, just boundaries she would push or make me uncomfortable and I would say stop and she's like well why 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 what did I do I didn't do anything wrong you know and then I would just be like okay okay you know I didn't you didn't do anything wrong and just leave it at that you know just push my boundaries if you want do whatever you had to do and I would just be like a people pleaser but I didn't have people to please just my mom I didn't have anybody to take care of or you know help understand me it was just her 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 all the time my mom how hard has it been right now I know that this is the first the only person you feel like you have had and now that you're separated how hard is it to make that distinction right now just do you I, want to talk to her no no I don't want any contact with her at all. I just want to live my life away from her. She can do whatever she wants. I don't care. I just want to live my life. You know, I want to have a family, a job, a car, just a house. I just want to live my life. Be, I just want to be happy. I don't want to keep going back to those negative thoughts she always has on me. I'm so tired of them. I'm so tired of those thoughts. Just constant negativity around that house and I just I hate it. Seems like every time she comes around me it just it just fuels negativity into me like she's just downloading it into my brain over and over and I don't like it. Did, did she make you when police were there ever times where police would come to your house to check on you? Um that you recall? I think at one point did your mom, did you have interaction with the police or did your mom make you hide? Like, how were you able to get away? I know just, police mentioned some fake names. Did you actually speak to the police ever? Um, like once or twice, maybe once when I was driving my mom's car and they pulled us over because, you know, she wasn't feeling good. She had took some pain medicine after a surgery and, you know, she was struggling to drive. So I was like, you know, just get over, you know, just get in the passenger seat. I'll take you home. It's not too far, you know? And, um, 
yeah, they pulled me over for something like that, but I don't remember what name I gave them. She, she told me, you know, just say something else, say a different name, because they don't, you know, they're going to arrest you. I'm just like, why can't I just tell them my name, you know? What was it like, I mean, eight years without seeing some of your, your closest family members, and every time they'd come over, what would you have to do? Hide. If my uncles or my aunts came to visit my mom or my family would come to visit my grandma, that's the main reason they would go over there to see my grandma and it, I would just have to listen to my family be happy and cheerful on the other side of a door and I'm just like I, I want my families you know I just want people I just want communication I just want people to understand that we need to start talking more and just stop you know like did you want to just end it right there and go out and tell them that you're you're here and you're okay? I just I just want them to know that I wanted to scream for them, but at the same time I just couldn't because I the only person I was able to trust was my mom. She told me so many things about my other family that I didn't know. I didn't I wasn't able to verify. Was your grandma living with you at one point? Yes, ma'am. And you I took had care interact. Of her. So, and she tried to tell people that you were there? Yes, ma'am. She was had Alzheimer's, was she sick? She had Alzheimer's and dementia, sundown syndrome. She had a bunch of medical issues and that's why I took care of her the best I could. And did she ever say to you anything about Rudy, go out, tell police, like let's, did she ever say anything to you? Because it seems I, like she tried to tell family members that you were there. Yeah, I think she tried telling people, but it's just my mom just, I don't know. I'm honestly not sure about that one. Do you, do you feel like your mom held you captive? Is that how you would? Pretty you... much. I mean, in a sense, just not in a physical, you know, restraints or anything, but mentally she held me against my will, which is, I wanted to just come out and say stuff and be honest. And every time I would try to, she would just either be, no, don't do it. Or, all right, go, go why do, you, do it. Why do you think she did that? I, I don't know. It's because maybe a lot of both of our problems stemmed from my brother passing away. My brother had passed away and ever since then, he was like our glue, you know, he was, our, he was like the father figure, you know, he's a provider, he took care of the family, you know, me and my mom. And then when I couldn't do, you know, take care of my mom anymore, I had to take care of my grandma. And it was just, it was difficult, like, it was especially at the end. Do you see your mom change her personality over the years? She's always kind of had that mentality, you know, like try to talk to her about something positive and then, or like, you know, address her issues. And then my mom would just deviate, sidetrack, or completely ignore it. Especially stuff like mental health or... If this is your chance, finally. We've heard from family members. We've heard from police. It's finally your chance to tell your story. Is there anything that you want people to know? about what happened to you? I just, I wanted to live my life and just something inside of my brain kept going back to her like she was my life support in a sense, you know, I needed her. Or at least she made me feel that way, you know. She never gave me the confidence or the guidance or the teaching that I needed, you know. She never gave me anything other than just the bare necessities and a job worth slaving over to help her pay bills and debts or whatever or tickets and stuff you know With, without getting into specifics um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard or seen what Quanell told the media last week about what in particular about things that you he says that you told him in that hotel room last week um, specifically about the sexual, some of the sexual things. See, that's what I'm saying, the twisting, no, I didn't say anything like intercourse or this and that. But like, no, he, I don't necessarily think he, he didn't get into specifics like that either, but he did say, mention that your mom wanted you to play the role of husband in the house. Yeah, pretty well. much. It basically felt like that. Like, you know, make sure to cook or, oh, you didn't make me any food, you didn't do this and that. It's just like, I just want to provide for myself I don't want to keep providing for my mom I just treat it like a roommate towards the end you know like I'm tired of being your son I just want to be your roommate I just want to live my life give me my check instead of 60 
dollars for 12 hour shifts seven days a week at night you know like i just want to live she would make you go to work with her is that yes ma'am and then um we again we don't want to twist your words we want to say it from your perspective and we want to yes, make sure we get this right so i know she had you play the role of a father but as far as sexual assault or something of that nature did she ever force you don't have to go into no, detail but she didn't force herself on me or anything like that like it wouldn't be anything like I would have to go get a rape kit or go file a police report. Okay. It would never be anything like that. Just stuff that really made me uncomfortable and I didn't have any references or other people to bounce off of to understand that like, if it's a healthy thing that she does or not, you know, maybe it's just me not understanding how people work because she's the only person I understand, but. Would, are you, would you say that you and your mom have a, a normal, Son mother relationship? I mean, not after all of that. Not after everything she did. And to be honest, I don't want one with her. When you finally left a few weeks ago, when you were found at the church, what happened? Did you just finally have enough? Yeah, I just been walking. I just wanted to get away. I didn't care if I had a car or money or anything. I don't care about money. I don't care about a car. I don't care about anything. Just happiness and love. Were you, were, how, how did you end up at the church? Did you just have nowhere to go? I just kept walking around. I just kept trying to find back home, you know, something that felt familiar. And the only thing that felt familiar was this side of town, you know. I grew up over there by Austin and Humble and Jackson and all that, you know. Not Humble, Jackson and Humble, or Austin and, you know, just that general area by the freeway, you know. So I kind of got a general sense of where I was going, but I just couldn't find something to be happy at. Just around a church, and I rolled with being at a church, you know. Are you, are you still talking Churches with your mom? Safe. No. I don't want any contact with her, but she keeps trying to come around. If she sees this story, what would you tell her? Just leave me alone. Just let me live my life. Just want to be happy, and I'm happy now. This and I'm working on it. Rudy working and on being happy. What would you say to, to people that think that somehow, you know, now that you're an adult, that you were in on this? What would you say to those people that don't understand Stockholm? It's very much a real thing, and it's a struggle, and you're the only one that understands it. It's even worse when everybody wants to assume the worst rather than understand and communicate genuinely and honestly, because there's just too much confusion in this world. How are you feeling now? Is there relief? How? Yeah, very much. A lot of relief. It just feels like I'm just at peace now. It just feels happy, you know? And how have police been handling this, do you think? How, what's your, what have they been saying to you, and what's it been like? I mean, they're trying the best that they can and giving me space that they can, but it's just, it's, it's a struggle still, you know? I'm just slowly trying to take it one day at a time, you know? It's, it's just a lot to, it overwhelms me very much. G given everything that you've been through and, and with your mom, I mean, do you think there's something that police should know about? Just that there's a lot of corruption. And it's literally through the colors. Like I said, I'm not saying, oh, there's corrupt cops and this and that. Literally, it's a corruption of the mind. It's through nanobots and <laughs> It's through the, age, like the flu vaccines and everything. That's why people have that first memory of waking up and being alive whenever they're a kid, you know? It's like... Like I said, literally corruption, like the colors. I'm not talking about the skin tones. I literally mean actual colors. Whenever you look at them, they influence the direction you go. And online, the media, like the computers and the people we talk to, it's all connected in a sense. That's why it just confuses us. Whenever we look at white things, we get distracted and stuff. And we look at the reds and we remind us that it's love, but they kind of influence us to assume, you know, like through bad stuff online they're like oh red's bad you know it's evil it's a devil for, it's like it's not all that for eight years you haven't really been able to speak to anyone besides some neighbors your mom going to work sometimes your communication seems like it's been very little do you think that's impacted you throughout the years as yes. not being able to really have real relationships with exactly people? i wasn't able to understand like how people thought or acted you know like i would try to introduce myself say hello to people online or this and that and Every time it just seemed like 
you know, just completely get shot down by people and I'm just trying to make friends or socialize and it's just like, I don't understand how to talk to people sometimes, you know, it feels like I'm speaking a completely different language than them and I just don't understand sometimes. Would you call yourself a victim? Yes, heavily. I'm what? almost done, personally, I don't know about you guys, yeah. but um, for the longest time you've, you've stayed hidden, you haven't been able to say who you are. Is it nice? I mean, you can say who you are now. You can you can be your own self and do your own life. Yes, sir. What are you hoping? Just a job, get my own money, and help out my communities, help out my people, and help out other kids like me. Because I don't want this to happen to other people, because I'm sure it happens to a lot of people. A lot of abuse and just neglect and just harmful ways of parenting that shouldn't be out there you know there's just so many negative ways that kids are just getting abused and they don't understand or realize that there's no help for them I, another question we have for you is so it's totally up to you or not at first we weren't going to because of the sexual assault aspect but we want to put the record straight that you said that's parts not true yes, do you want to show your face or you don't want to show your face I, i'm not a big fan of showing my face okay. especially with a lot of people yeah. already knowing what i look like oh, it yeah. just makes yeah. it even worse yeah. well, i just want to make sure yes, don't worry Any, rudy we got you anything we didn't ask that you think is important that you want us to mention because we were here to finally tell your story anything that we didn't ask that you want to make sure people know about um, just, all I can say is just spread positivity and love. The people that you're with, you know, a lot of people are coming down hard on Nikki and, and the people They don't with. deserve it. They okay. don't. They really don't. They helped me so much and they've given me a place to stay and the family, in a sense, you know, it makes me happy. Yeah. It really does. I never had, you know, a lot of people to talk with or socialize with and... It just makes me happy knowing that I have people here that I can trust and that can take care of me and that understand that, you know, sometimes people struggle. So just, so you consider yourself safe, out of harm, all that, right? Like you're with... Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm happy um, here. I'm very happy here. And they're very good people. Mm -hmm. They don't deserve any negativity towards them or hatred. They should have a lot of help and support and guidance and just prayers and positivity just everything that they, anybody would need to be happy in life you know just and your mom when she comes by do you feel like you know you, you are being like kept away from her when she comes and stops by or tries to talk to you i or? just don't want her here because i know the way she acts it influences everybody around me it's not just me it's like she sends that negativity towards me and then i send it back out towards everybody else and i don't want that yeah I know uh, Grizzly was mentioning that you might have had like a, someone from your high school reach out and you've had a lot of attention of people, from this, yeah. uh, a, a girl. Yeah, yeah, well, you got some <laughs> classmates, man, when you were going to, call, uh, uh, to Catholic school, you got some classmates reaching out, which I told you about. Uh, any messages to all the people that, are, that know you from before all this went down, uh, that love you, that say they're here for you? Just um, thank you very much for reaching out and when I'm ready, when I'm ready, I'll be able to reach out to the people I care about and love. And are, are, you su are you surprised by all this attention? I mean, it's been on the news across the world. I wasn't expecting that much attention, to be honest. I didn't realize that it was happening so big, you know, just growing so much. Are you going to take, I know police mentioned that there were some resources. Are you plans to talk to anybody that they put you in touch with? Um, at some point. It's just right now, I just rather do it by myself, you know, just try to learn to understand how to live and be a normal person, you know. Have you gotten grow an, and be nice. Have you gotten an attorney? I don't, I don't know, I don't think so. Lawyer, no? No, sir, I don't, not that I'm aware of. And then, have you talked to Quanell since you saw him at the hotel? No. No? Okay. No, sir. You guys have anything else? Anything else you want to add, Rudy? Um just spread some positivity okay. spread wild flower not wild fire because we need more colors and beauty in this world we don't need any more hatred or burning things down we need to just stop 
you know, trying to disassemble everything and just take out the bolts and the screws and try to clean things, you know, instead of looking at everything so negatively, just look at all the positivity in the world. Focus on the positivity because every time you focus on the negativity, it just creates more negativity around you and your communities. Since that interview, there have been no updates to this case. It's obvious, based on Rudy's own public statements, that he went through hell in that home, and the fact that police have not put him in protective custody or questioned his mother beyond the initial interview doesn't make a lot of sense. Hopefully, we see an update to this case in the near future, but until we do, that is it. Let me know what you think happened in this case, and why you believe Janie had her son go missing. As always, if there is a video you would like to see made by my brother and I, or a case you would like more attention brought to, email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. Have a good day, and remember to stay safe.